All righty. Everybody doing well? All right. All right. How many of you are nursing colds right now? Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? So, if you went to any of the outreaches we did uh, earlier this week, you probably caught a little bit of fire, and you probably caught a little bit of a cold too. It seems like everybody who was there caught a cold. We all, well, the apostles considered all things common property, I suppose. <laughs> but anyway, I'm on the back side of one right now, but if I seem a little sniffly, please forgive me. Uh, um, but all right, well, I'll tell you what, gang, let's open up to 1 John chapter 4, and let's pray. Father, I pray. Lord, that you would settle our hearts as we step into your word. Lord, I thank you for just all the great things you're doing around here. Lord, thank you for the 30 plus people who responded to the gospel in the outreaches, Lord. Um, it is a privilege to, to stand at the door and, and watch them walk in, Lord, and, and, and be a part of, of, of what we have, Lord, in Christ. We thank you so much. And I pray, my Lord, all the more that as we walk through your word this morning, that, that this Christian life, Lord, and this experience we have would only become all the more real in our minds and in the, in the outworking as well, Lord. So I pray, please, Lord, um, take advantage of our time this morning. I pray that you ultimately would do the speaking. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. First John chapter 4, we'll pick up at verse 17. Now, last week Jake preached <clears throat> regarding uh, John chapter 2. And so, uh, real quickly, we'll kind of give you an overview of where we've been then in, in First John. In the first four verses of this letter, John declared the incarnation, the bodily uh, coming of Jesus Christ as he deals with the effects of Gnosticism in the early church. And then in chapter 1, verse 5, through chapter 2, verse 28, we looked at this issue of fellowship with God, and we defined it both uh, ethically and theologically. And then from there, John takes on the, the subject of sonship with God, and he defines that ethnically, uh, ethnically <laughs> ethically and theologically, all right? <laughs> Very important, these two words. There's a difference, you know. But I thank my Lord that in His kingdom, it's every tribe, every tongue, every nation. Amen? So, um, now, in chapter 4, verse 7, John moves into this idea of the Christian life in general and defines it ethically and doctrinally and theologically. And so, the last time we opened up this book, we looked at the source of love. God is love and, and all that went with that. Now this morning, we look at the fruit of love and the necessity of love, picking up at verse 17. Now, earlier in chapter 12 of verse 4, John said this, if we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. Now John reminds us of this again. He says, love has been perfected among us in this that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. Love has been perfected among us. Now, that word perfected, right? It's um, teleo, and, and it means to complete something in order to fulfill a task. That's the idea. Love has been completed in us in order to fulfill a task. Now, remember that God is love. He abides in us, and therefore His love has been perfected in us. Love has been completed in us in order that a particular task might be fulfilled. A certain fruit might be born. And what is it? It's this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. How many of you think about the day of judgment? Just out of curiosity. You know, there is a day of judgment coming. All men will stand before God and they will give an account for themselves, right? Uh, the writer of Hebrews says it's appointed for all men to die once and then there's the judgment, right? Now, everybody knows this internally, but few actually want to entertain that reality, let alone accept it. But for you and I, John's telling us there's nothing to fear for 
the word boldness here, parisia, it refers to all outspokenness, or frankness, assurance, confidence, or openness. Essentially, it means to speak freely. You have nothing to fear in the day of judgment, John says, because love has been perfected in you. Now, you and I have boldness in the day of judgment. You understand, of course, not everybody's going to have that. In the day of judgment, we have this boldness. We can speak freely to God. That blows me away. I mean, I, I, I read of heaven in the scriptures and the angels, they, they block their eyes with their wings as they cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And yet you and I, we have this boldness to walk boldly before the throne of God in time of need, right? And find grace. But Paul wrote this to, to the church in Rome in chapter 3 of, of the letter of Romans in verses 19 and 20. He wrote this to them. He says, now what we know, uh, says, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight for by the law, there is the knowledge of sin. So when, when those who don't, who aren't in fellowship with the Lord, stand before him, their mouths will be stopped. Well, what does that mean exactly? Well, it means like this. You, the, the man who stands before God on the day of judgment can't say, well, I'm better than that guy because that guy isn't the standard of judgment, right? The law is. Nor can he say, I'm a good person because the law, which is God's standard of judgment, says otherwise. How many of you here are good? Because you know, hell is full of people who thought they were good. How many of you are forgiven? Ah, totally different thing, right? And so when the unbeliever stands before God in the day of judgment, he'll be with ex without excuse. There is no defense. He'll have nothing to say on his own behalf. He'll remain shamefaced and silent before the judge of the ages. But you and I, we have a boldness. We have a confidence. We can even speak freely. You see, God is love. He abides in us. We abide in Him. The result is that we love one another and we have confidence then before God. In other words, on the day of judgment, you have nothing to fear. <laughs> Amen, sister. You've got nothing to fear. And then John justifies what he says. He says, because as he is, as God is. Now, John has described God in two particular ways. He said God is light, light being emblematic of truth, of course, and God is love. As God is, so you are. You are truth and love, so are we in this world, writes John. So because he abides in us and because we abide in him, because we walk in righteousness, because we love one another, we are not like the world. We are like him in this world. You are his emissaries, not his enemies. Verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. So John says here, there is no fear in love. Now, love here, of course, is agape, right? It's that selfless, benevolent love of God. Those who practice agape love, there is no fear. Now, remember the context. The context here is the day of judgment, okay? When we stand before him, we'll have all boldness and confidence which is quite the opposite of fear. But then John make, says the word but, right? There's the contrast. But perfect love casts out fear. That is mature love, the love of God in us, expressed outwardly to others, forcibly displaces fear. It casts fear away. You see, agape love and fear do not make good bedfellows. The more you abide in God's love, the less you have to fear, right? I mean, does God judge people for getting together and, and emptying some apartments or storage sites on behalf of other believers? No. Will you stand before God in the day of judgment because you helped out a brother or sister in the faith? 
in their time of need? Of course not. You see, you cannot emulate the love of God and at the same time fear His judgment. And here's why. For those who love as God loves, there is no judgment. You see, that judgment was suffered 2,000 years ago. In fact, I, I love what, what uh, Warren Wearsby said in his commentary. He says, for the Christian, judgment is not future, it's past. I'm identified with what happened 2,000 years ago on Golgotha. That was the judgment. I'm in Christ. He was judged there. There is no future judgment, a punitive judgment. There is no future punitive judgment for you and for me. There is a judgment of rewards, but it's not punitive. And then John says this, because fear involves torment. Now, does that mean we're not to fear God? Well, that depends on how you define fear. We shouldn't have a, a phobic, sort of terroristic fear of God. We do have a, rev, a reverential fear of God. We stand in awe of God, but we don't have to fear Him like an abusive father. Now, the word torment here is colossus, and, and it refers to punitive judgment. It's only used twice in the New Testament. It's used here, and then it's used in Matthew 25, verse 46, where... <clears throat> where Jesus says, you, 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 you saw that I was hungry and yet you gave me no food. You gave me no drink. You saw that I was sick or imprisoned and you did not visit me. Right? He said, those will be sent into everlasting punishment, the righteous to eternal life. Well, that, that word punishment in Matthew 25, 46 is the other use of this particular word, Colossus. And so we understand this to mean that fear of God's judgment involves punitive or judicial consequences. Why? Because God's love is not in that person. They haven't abided in His love. They haven't received His love as it was expressed in Christ. The greatest expression that humanity will ever know is, is the coming of the Christ on our behalf. But if they won't accept that and abide in that, then there is a judgment, a punitive judgment. And so John's summation here is that love bears the fruit of boldness while fear bears the fruit of torment. But, he says, contrasting the one in who God's love has been perfected, he says, he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Now, if you fear the day of judgment, it's simply because you haven't been abiding in God's love. You haven't truly comprehended the love that God has for you. How much more could he have given you than his own son? Right? If he did not spare his own son, but freely gave him up for us all, will he not give us all things? Writes Paul in Romans. Now, let me say this. There are a lot of things that if you abide in them, they will cause worry. They will cause fear. They will cause anxiety. But God's word isn't one of them. If you want to watch horror movies all the time, I'm not surprised if you have issues of fear and insecurity. If you want to read books that aren't edifying, I'm not surprised. There's all kinds of things you can abide in that will cause fear, but God's word, God's love, that casts out fear. Now, as we've noted already, the primary context here is the day of judgment. I would argue, however, that this idea that love casting out fear is still applicable in everyday life. On a secondary level, the more you abide in God's love, the less you have to fear. The more you abide in God's word, the less you have to fear. But I'll tell you what, if you're abiding in the nightly news, man, that will not bring peace to your soul, will it? Let's just be honest. Now, am I saying you shouldn't watch the news? No, I'm not saying that. But abiding, that word meno in Greek means to remain in that place. If you're going to remain, if you put Fox News on from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. every night, let me tell you, you're going to be a very scared person. Regardless, I don't care if it's CNN, MS, I don't care. It has its effect. What you abide in, gang, listen, what you abide in has a real effect in the way that you interact with this world. 
Writing to Timothy, Paul said this, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. That's what God has given you. So for heaven's sake, abide in him, abide in his love, abide in his word. All right? And, and this issue of fear and insecurity and worry will gradually dissipate. Verse 19, we love him because he first loved us. Absolutely, right? The, to love God is the primary response to God's love for us. It all begins with his love, expressed first in the sending of the Christ on our behalf. Now, when you abide in his love, good things happen, right? God loved us first. We respond by loving him. God abides in us. We abide in him. We practice righteousness. We love one another. And we have boldness in the day of judgment. These are the things that John has been talking about. But the confidence we have before God is di directly related to his love for us. Now, let me say this, however. There's a temptation to view those seven points that I just made, right? God loved us first. We love him. God abides in us. We abide in him. We practice righteousness. We love one another. We have confidence before God in the day of judgment. There is a temptation for us to look at that as sort of a, a seven-step process towards Christian maturity, but John doesn't present it that way. He presents these seven points as sort of concurrent realities in the Christian life. What, what Paul would give to us systematically, John presents to us holistically. You see, our faith, listen, I can't say this enough. I love systematic theology. And I've got books and books and books of it on my shelf. I love these older brothers and the way they put things together. But our faith is more than a systematic theology or a catechism. It's a state of being. And to respond to God's love expressed in Christ is to enter into all those other things. So then may we continue to abide in his love. Because in the end, it brings confidence to your soul before an almighty God who will judge this world. Now, having then shown us the fruit of love, John now shares us the necessity of love, and he gives us three expressions of it, beginning in verse 20. We look at the first one, sincere love. If someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? All right. John begins here, verse 20, if someone says, this is the last of seven hypothetical phrases that John uses in this particular letter. Um, for the sake of time, I won't read them all. I think there they are. You can take your phone out and take a pic if you want to study them later. John uses this kind of phraseology to present the possibility of hypocrisy, all right? And he says, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, John says he's a liar. Now, the words love and hate here in verse 20 are in the present tense, and so we would understand it this way. If someone says, I am loving God, and at the same time hating his brother, he's a liar. Remember, this is speaking about habitual love and hate. The love and, and the hate that characterizes a person's life. If a person characteristically claims to be loving God, and yet habitually he doesn't love his neighbor, then he's a Liar, says John. Now, the word liar here is very interesting. It's suestes in Greek, and it speaks of someone who falsifies things, but it also speaks of someone who breaks faith, who's of false faith, or who has no faith at all. And so then, if you claim to love God, but you don't love your brother and sisters in the faith, then you're not the real deal. And this is what John's having to deal with because of the effects of Gnosticism in the church. It was starting to break relationships among people as the sort of elitist mentality was being developed. You know, this whole thing of elitism is nothing new. You know that. It's been going on as long as humanity has been. And so John's saying, hey, they can claim to love God, but if they're not loving one another, they're fake. They're false. They're liars. They're false teachers. Don't follow them. 
I wish I could just say that to the younger generation. Before you take someone's advice, for heaven's sake, look at their life and say, is that what I want my life to look like? You could save yourself a lot of pain, young people. <laughs> Trust me, I can say it firsthand. So, now he says, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. Now John substantiates that. He says, for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? Think about this for a moment, right? It, it takes more faith to love someone you've never seen than to love someone you have seen. And so then, if you will not love your brothers and sisters in the faith who you do see, then you simply cannot love God. That's John's argument. I mean, how can we, how can we not seek to meet our brothers' and sisters' needs in the fellowship in light of the fact that God has met our greatest need by sending Christ on our behalf? In light of what I've gained in Christ, should it be a big deal to swing over and pick up some groceries to someone who really needs it? What about outside of the fellowship? John's primary context is in the church, but it's not exclusive. What about beyond that? It's not unreasonable, right? I mean, let's face it, going to the grocery store is more sacrificial now than it's ever been, amen? <laughs> That's some real love when you do someone's grocery shopping for them. <laughs> now, here's something that's really interesting. I, I kind of picked this up this week as I was studying through this. What John describes in the context of love, James describes in the context of faith. In James chapter 2, verses 15 to 17, James writes this, If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warm, be filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. You see, to, to have our greatest need met by God and yet neglect a brother's needs is to have a dead faith according to James, and it's to not love God according to John. Because dead faith and not loving God are essentially the same thing. Verse 21, In this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. This command we have from him. John is reaching back 60 years earlier, the three and a half years he walked with the Lord, And there, in the Gospel of John, twice, no less than twice, Jesus commands that we love one another. In John 13, 34, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. The next chapter, John 15, verse 12, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Do you notice in each time that Jesus commands us to love one another, he reminds us that he's loved us first. Abide in that love. Listen, gang, abide in that love, and you'll find it so much easier to love other people. But if you abide on the, the, the uh, sales receipt from the grocery store, if that's what you're going to abide in, then you're not really going to want to go to the grocery store on behalf of someone else, right? Or, or meet their need. This world is coming apart. Let's just be honest. We're living in a society that's being torn to shreds. People like you who dare to, to fear God and seek to walk in His ways are being labeled as nationalistic. And I, they love to throw all kinds of, you know, nicknames on you and all that. In light of that, you and I should be the most confident of people. And we can be if we just abide in His love. The, the natural fruit of that is to go out and love one another. Remember that song, Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see? Well, the Father up above is looking down in love. I know I should have led worship today. Right? <laughs> be careful, little hands, what you touch. Be careful, little feet, where you go. Be careful what you abide in, gang. 
But I'll tell you what, as this world comes apart and you can still walk fearlessly and boldly before God, people are going to see it and they're going to say, what's going on in your life? And it's every opportunity to share the gospel. Now we move into chapter 5. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves him, who begot, also loves him, who is begotten of him. Now, who is the whoever mentioned here in, in this particular verse? John gives two qualifications. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ born of God, that speaks of the incarnation as well as his divinity, and he who loves the Father, that is him who begot. Clearly, John is speaking then here of the true believer. Whoever believes, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ, that he is born of God, and who loves God, also loves him who is begotten of God. That's the rest of us, <laughs> right? What's John's point? If you love the Father, you will love his family. I'll be honest with you. I'm going to really step on your toes today. Is that okay? When I get up in the morning, when I, especially Sunday morning, I, I journal. I have to journal when I pray because if I don't, I fall asleep, right? I, I go into, into echo mode, right? So I don't want to conserve too much energy, so I get my pencil, and I have a tactile function, and so basically I write out my prayers in my journal. And every morning it's like, thank you, Lord, I can come here. And then I come here, and I, I like to get here early. Sometimes I have things to do here, sometimes I don't. I make the coffee, I do whatever. I like being here. I anticipate you coming. I like to be the first guy here, and I like to greet you guys as you're coming in. Because I love God's people. Now I'm going to step on your toes. If you show up half an hour late every Sunday, what are you loving? Now I understand sometimes the car doesn't start. Sometimes the kids aren't cooperating very well. I understand all that. But uh, are you loving to hit the snooze button a couple extra times? Are you just loving going through the phone? In the I, I don't know. I know. I'm going there. But for heaven's sake, most of you don't show up late for work. I don't know. <laughs> because you fear your boss more than you fear your God. Amen? If you love the Father, you'll love His family. Now, is the only expression here in the weekly gathering? Of course not. Let it not be. Let it be all the time. You know, Saturday morning, a bunch of us got together, those who were able, and we took care. We hung out together. It was a sweet time of fellowship, you know? Um, We'll just leave it at that. I've probably done myself a hole already. So, you know, if you love the Father, you love His family. Fair enough? All right. So, first expression then, we would call sincere love. Second expression, verse 2, willful obedience. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep His commandments. So, John now shares with us the evidence of loving one another, and he says it's loving God and keeping His commandments. To love God is to keep His commandments. They're linked there in the Greek, just so you know that. So, which commandments are we then to keep? I would suggest the ten. The ten are emblematic of the 613 that Moses gave, right? Essentially, it's the 613 laws condensed into ten. Now, the first four of those ten deal with our love for God, right? You shall have no other gods, no carved images, do not misuse His name, and keep the Sabbath holy. The last six deal with our love for one another. Honor your parents, right? Don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie, don't covet. They're all in relationship this way, horizontally. Jesus took them and he summarized them down to two, did he not? Right? The first four, love your God, will your heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? And the other one is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. That's Matthew 22, of course. What's the point here? That the idea of loving God and loving one another is, is they're not separable. It's a code. It's a cohesive unit that finds its, its origin in God's love for us through the coming of the Messiah. And so to do the first four is to do the second six. You don't love God if you're not loving His people. And if you're not loving His people, then you're not loving God. That's John's whole point here, is that you can't separate these things. Oh, I love God, but to heck with everybody else. 
John says you're a liar in that case. Verse 3, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. See, our love for God is expressed in our desire to walk in his ways, right? John 14, verse 15, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. John 15, 10, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I've kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. Same idea. And then John says this, his commandments are not burdensome. Now, the word burdensome here, baros, it, it refers to that which is weighty, grievous, or, or heavy. Is keeping God's commandments a drag for you? I wonder how many of you in here are raising a young adolescent boy right now. Something about young adolescent boys, they don't like to take showers, do they? For, for a young adolescent boy, taking a shower, is, it's a real drag. It's a real pain in the neck. It's hardly worth the effort. And if you're a parent and you have that young boy who doesn't want to take a shower, I have great news for you. It's going to change. Because while it's a real drag right now, not long from now, he's going to have a crush. And then you won't be able to get him out of the shower. Right? <laughs> True story, true story, because that is the motivating power of love. Suddenly taking a shower isn't a drag, it has vital personal interest to it. And so it is with us and our love for God. It, it makes his commandments not a drag, but a joy. I love to meet needs when I can. I can't meet every need. I'm just one man, right? One man among a couple hundred or whatever. I don't know how many people come here, but whatever. But I do my part. I try to. It's always a joy to give stuff away. Come to my house sometime. You'll leave with something out of my garage. I guarantee you. <laughs> Especially as springtime comes and we've got to rotate the junk. I want to meet your needs. So make sure you swing by, okay? But keeping the commands should never be a drag. Jesus said in, in Matthew 11, verses 28 and 30, you know it well, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know what Jesus is saying? Is take that heavy load off your back and take my yoke upon you. You're going to find it a whole lot easier. Paul says the same thing. We're going to talk about giving now, all right? Only for a second. But Paul says the same thing in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. He says, let each one gives as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. What's the point? The point is this. Listen, if tithing is a real drag to you, then don't tithe. Go sort it out with God. God would rather have 50 cents from you with a happy heart than a million dollars with a begrudging heart. And if loving God and loving His people has, begun, has, has become a burden, you can be sure that something else has captured your attention. I, that's what I see in my own life. When there are those times when, when sometimes, you know, ministry seems like a real burden. Oh, there's another, you know, something else I got to do, whatever. And when that happens, I usually find that there's an idol that's moved into my life. There's a transgression of the first commandment, and then everything from there falls apart. <laughs> Moving on to verse 4, our third expression of love, victorious living. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. John says, whatever is born of God, that's you and me, right? According to the very first verse of the chapter we're in right now. The word born and begotten, it's the, the Greek word uh, geneo, it's, uh, it's the same. Begotten in verse 1 is born in verse 4. He says, Whatever is born of God overcomes the world, or that is, prevails over this corrupt system. Okay. John says, overcomes the world. According to John, 
If you've been born again, you've been born of God, you've overcome the world. Does it always feel that way? No, sometimes life's a real battle, isn't it? Uh, I still have to fight battles in daily living, right? But the overcoming has already happened. It's an interesting concept. How is that? Well, John says, this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. How is it that we overcome the world? This corrupt system we live in, it's through our faith, right? Have you guys heard that song? I, I, I hear it a lot, and you might like it. It's not a bad song, but it's, I'm going to see a victory. 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 I think it's like 100 times. I'm going to see a victory. I'm gonna, uh, what's the name of that song? Probably I'm going to see a victory. I don't know. I'm going to tell you, dear brothers and sisters, I've seen the victory already, and it's called the cross of Christ. And whether my circumstances work out to my personal liking or not, that victory remains nevertheless. So many people say things like, I don't have victory over that area of my life. I would tell you, dear brother or sister, yes, you do. You just need to walk in it. You see, you and I don't fight for victory. We fight from victory. By your faith, you've already prevailed or overcome this world. The Levites in Joshua's time crossing the Jordan River had to get their feet in the river, didn't they? When they got their feet in the river, we read that the waters were stopped in the city of Adam, which is 19 miles upstream. See, the work had already been done, but they were required to get their feet wet before they would see that the work was done, right? When the Israelites came into the promised land, they held their swords, but had God not already sent the hornets in to chase most of the people off? The work was done. It was just a mop-up operation from that point. Hezekiah sought the Lord in prayer. After that, he discovered that 185,000 Assyrians had been killed out there in the field, right? Gideon, interestingly, was obedient to God's word even when it seemed to his disadvantage, right? He pruned a fighting force from 30,000 to 300. Not typically what you don't want to do when you're going into, into battle. You don't want to prune your your army's down drastically. That's what he did, and God delivered, right? And even if we should be martyred like the Old Testament prophets or the New Testament apostles, have we not overcome the corruption of this world? You've overcome already. Go walk in it. Remember what John wrote last week, you are of God, little children, and overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in this world. Precious people, abide in him. Amen. Verse 5, who is he who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? So John brings these, these last four verses full circle into verse 5. We believe that Jesus is the Christ and born of God, thus we've overcome the world. We've overcome the world because we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, right? Now, those who refuse to believe that Christ is the Son of God remain subject then to the corruption of this world and the judgment, of course, that then comes afterward. There's only one way to prevail, gang, and it's in Christ. That's what John's telling us here. Now, we talk about victory. I'm telling you now, you have it already. If you're in Christ, you have the victory. It's a done deal. You're on the winning team. Don't join the team because it's the winning team. Join the team because it's the right team. Amen? <clears throat> but I'd like you all to turn to Romans chapter 8 this morning. And do something a little different. I'm not going to do all the talking. You are. How's that sound? <laughs> Romans chapter 8, verses 35 to 39. I'd like to read it together with you as a reminder. As we continue to press forward in God's love and loving one another. Everybody there? Romans 8, verse 35 to 39. I'll start. You can jump in with me, okay? But you have to promise to jump in with me. Because you guys love it when I do all the talking. 
and I just sit here and sweat. <coughs> so, <laughs> who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you believe it? Then abide in it and find confidence in it. Amen.